Uh, my name is Najee. My advisor is uh, Dr. Bakshi. I want to thank him for uh, his supervision and support uh, throughout this dissertation. I also want to take the time to thank my committee member, Dr. Sushankar, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shaw, and Dr. Mahalovitz. So this dissertation is wrapped around computer-aided diagnosis of radiology images. In this picture, you see a couple of uh, different types of radiology images, and the arrows are showing the abnormalities. As you can see, uh, the abnormalities are normally very visually hard to detect. And also, uh, also we believe that healthcare is one of the high-risk applications of AI, and that's why uh, expert knowledge should be incorporated into any computerized um, uh, approach for a better control mechanism. Eye tracking is one of the many uh, uh, ways that we can uh, basically integrate this uh, expert knowledge, uh, which we also use in this dissertation as well. Also, there is another component that needs to be used uh, for image analysis, which we propose to set up computer vision solutions for each task. This is a general framework of uh, uh, my work in this dissertation. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, images of radiologists looking at the CT scans uh, for a cancer screening process for single single screen uh, single screen screening and multi-screen screening. Uh, we record the eye tracking data using a desk mounted eye tracker. We apply a set of graph analysis to extract the regions of interest and analyze that pattern of search in the gaze and then we have uh, our collaboration with computer vision solutions for detection, diagnosis, size measurement and uh, segmentation of the abnormalities. And then the results are shown back to the radiologists. So before moving on, I want to talk about uh, the radiology room setting because it is very important uh, of, uh, on how we basically set up this collaboration framework. The radiology room settings are dedicated light source rooms, uh, darkened environment, and should be limited interaction, distraction for the radiologists. So any kind of interaction that we want to use uh, with the radiologists should uh, basically expose minimal distraction for them not to hurt their decision. And that's why we propose a desk mounted eye tracker which is minimal distraction with the radiologists compared to other types like mouse clicks and wearing goggles and all of that. Radiology screening is very significant in cancer screening process. As an example, uh, I'll talk about the lung cancer screening, which uh, most of the topics of this dissertation is also wrapped around. Uh, it's been proved uh, that mortality rate can be reduced by 20% uh, with low-dose CT screening of lung cancers. Uh, however, human error remains as a significant issue in this process. It's been proved that 35% of the abnormalities are totally missed during the screening process and also overdiagnosis is a very huge problem that can cause unnecessary treatments. This great study in 2018 showed uh, why this missing are happening and studied the different types of biases in radiology screening to figure out what's happening going on. It showed that 30 uh, types of biases um, has basically found that can affect the decision of the radiologist. In this dissertation, we're targeting two main of those biases. The first one, when the radiologists are basically missing to explore one region in the CD scans, that can be because of many reasons. Maybe they're following a checklist approach that they'll learn in the school, or initializing a secondary search based on the decisions of the previous search, or any other reasons. And the other type is the type when the radiologists are missing the abnormalities while they're directly looking at it and it's, it's in their plain sight. That can be because of the nature of that abnormality is very similar to uh, the neighboring tissues and looks normal. For that, we propose a collaborative framework using our eye trackers and our computer vision solutions to fill this gap. So as an overview, we first model our gaze data into uh, a graph. And then after clustering and some graph analysis, we extract the regions of interest. This is going to be our gaze analysis. Uh, portion of my talk. And then we combine this with the imaging modalities uh, to get information from the CT scans. And then we propose a set of computer vision solutions for the image analysis uh, so that we target both the regions that the radiologists are struggling to make a decision and also the regions that they're missing to explore totally. This is the outline of my presentation. 
the image analysis modules are divided into local image analysis and global image analysis, which I'll go uh, into the details. The content of the first chapter, which is the design of how we collaborate using the eye tracker and extract the regions of interest, is published in the Medical Image Analysis Journal in 2018. This is an example of a 3D long CT scan, which radiologists normally uh, screen for uh, uh, doing the cancer screening process. And this is an example of uh, eye tracking data recorded from that, that scan. So we propose to model the uh, gaze data into the graphs because it makes the parameterization of the patterns pretty much easy. For that, we create the graph by using fixations as uh, vertexes and also saccades as the edges of the graph, which will end up having a graph joined with vertices and uh, edges as I defined. However, there's some challenges if we define the graph like this. This graph would have a, a, a consecutive uh, nature, meaning that the degree of each node would be maximum two, which makes any kind of graph analysis or sparsification pretty much impossible to do on this graph. The other thing is that we didn't encounter radiologist attention in this formulation and this model, which is pretty important given that we're dealing with a high-risk healthcare application. So in this chapter, we're targeting to uh, uh, tackle these two challenges. So the task in hand would be given a very dense graph, how can we sparsify that data for a better representation, analysis, and interpretation of the data? We first start by clustering the graph nodes, and this will handle the consecutive nature of that graph. So after uh, applying a clustering, a non-parametric clustering on the nodes of the graph, we then represent each cluster with the cluster center. And we reconstruct the graph as follows. All of the nodes which are connecting two nodes from two different clusters will now connect the nodes, the center of those two corresponding clusters. And all of the nodes which are basically connecting uh, the nodes inside each cluster will now be modeled as self loops. Both of these are going to be used in the way that we are defining the weights of the graph and how we define the attention to extract the ROIs. Once we deal uh, with the um, uh, sparsification and um, clustering of uh, the nodes, now we have uh, a graph which has a lot of redundant edges. For that, we are proposing to use a graph sparsification to get rid of the redundant edges. Before moving on, I'll uh, give a little background about graph sparsification. Spectral graph sparsification, the goal is uh, to remove the redundant edges while keeping the structure of the graph. So given a weighted graph G, the uh, sparse graph S should have the following properties. Assuming that the Laplacian, graph, uh, the Laplacian matrix of the graph G is defined as follows, <laughs> Uh, G hat is being defined to be in uh, sigma sp spectral similarity of G. And X's here are basically the nodes uh, as the vertices of the graph. So expanding this equation, we will end up having uh, the last equation, which basically uh, defines uh, a sparsified graph S based on a matrix alpha, which is a sparsification matrix, which allows how loose we want this sparsification to be. So to model the radiologist's attention and behavior, we propose to model this into the weights of our graph and then do the sparsification based on those weights so that we basically in, uh, encounter the radiologist's attention into our formulation. So the level of attention for each node can be modeled by two parameters, a global parameter, which is basically the number of nodes in each cluster, and also the number of a local parameter, which is uh, the number of self loops, uh, which is modeling the consecutive time that has been spent in a region. We believe that these two models, uh, these two parameters, are modeling two different behaviors in the screening and should be treated differently. Because one is basically consecutively uh, figuring out a region and trying to find out what's going on in the region, and the other one <coughs> may be going back and coming to the region again. With these, we define the edge weights as follows, with the exponential uh, function of these two parameters, which is a normalized weight, which gives a normalized weight between zero and one, based on the importance of the two edges, uh, the two nodes uh, on the sides of the edges. 
This is the algorithm for our sparsification. The input would be an unweighted graph and a sparsification parameter which decides how much we want to sparsify the graph and sacrifice the structure. And the output would be the sparsified graph. So for each two vertexes in the graph, we decide whether if there is an edge between them, we define uh, an edge weight based on the number of nodes in the clusters and also the number of self loops. And the weights are uh, computed as the equation that I just uh, mentioned. With that, we would end up having uh, uh, a weighted graph. So once we have the weighted graph, we basically, for sparsification, we sample uh, edges uh, from the weighted graph based on a probability proportion to the weight that we define and the effective resistance of that edge. The effective resistance of an edge in a graph is basically known to be the probability of that edge happening in a random spanning tree in the, in the graph, which is basically uh, measuring how important that node e, that edge is for keeping the structure of the graph. And then we add it to the sparse graph and, and end up having the sparse graph. So for this uh, part of my presentation, the results uh, uh, are captured based on uh, a collaboration that we had with NIH. Uh, we did experiments with three separate radiologists with three levels of uh, experience. Uh, one, radiologist number one is being the expert, and radiologist number uh, three is uh, the main radiologist. So in the first uh, row, uh, we see the dense data recorded from the raw eye tracker and then the time analysis on the total uh, screening process and the region that the, time, the most time has been spent, and also uh, the clustering of the nodes, which basically uh, the sparse representation. And as you can see, uh, based on the level of experience, you can actually tell how much the radiologists spend time and uh, you know, the, the targeted search versus a very extensive search. This is the same results on the graphs and the graph representation. Uh, the first column shows the raw data, the second column shows the clustering nodes, uh, the third column, the red edges are the ones which are picked to be removed by our sparsification, and the last one is the sparse graph. And these are our three radiologists, the same level of experience that I mentioned. We also did uh, a feasibility study on a multi-screen screening process of prostate cancer, just to show that our algorithm is also able to be used in different applications of screening. For the quantitative evaluation, uh, to measure uh, the performance of our sparsification method, uh, we propose to use diameter between S and Laplacian. Each of them are basically uh, capturing the structure of the graph somehow. Diameter is the measure of length of maximum shortest path in the graph. Between S measures the centrality of a node uh, by counting the number of shortest paths passing through that node, and Laplacian metrics is, of course, a representation of the graph structure. For the experiments, we did lung cancer screening experiments with all three radiologists, a multimodality prostate screening with those four modalities on the screens with one radiologist, and also a synthetic data composed of 5,000 nodes being connected consecutively. And these are the results for betweenness, diameter, and Laplacian. For betweenness and diameter, the less we drop the ratio is the better, and for Laplacian, uh, uh, the, the less that we actually uh, increase uh, the mean square error would be the better. And as you can see, by removing uh, around 40% of the nodes, we could basically keep the structure of the graph uh, pretty much uh, the same. So in summary, this chapter, I propose uh, a method that given a dense graph, uh, how do we end up having a sparse graph ball by keeping the structure and also uh, capturing the radiologist's attention into it. With that, I want to move uh, to the second part of my presentation, which is the local image analysis modules. Uh, the most important part in the local image analysis is to define the, the ROIs of the radiologists. We chose to uh, define the, the ROIs as the regions which are hard to make the decision uh, with the goal of addressing uh, the, the bias that I mentioned at the beginning of missing the abnormalities while in their plane site. So the hypothesis here is that if the radiologists are struggling in a region and spending so much time in there, most probably they're trying to make a decision, but they can't, although they're looking at it. So with that, uh, a set of tools which be, uh, will be useful for them to make the decision, uh, that can be size measurements of uh, the tissues in that region, which can be modeled as segmentation in computer vision, and also the diagnosis for the type of tissues that they're uh, looking at normal or abnormal, which can be modeled as a classification problem. 
To define the, the regions of interest, I use uh, the same two parameters, uh, number of nodes in each cluster and number of self loops, to define an attention level for each node in the graph. One being the highest attention and zero being the less attention. And then we can pick the regions of attention based on these values. First, I'll go into the local image analysis with a proof of concept Knowing that we have the regions of interest, I first show how it is feasible to basically uh, use that in any kind of image analysis module. The content of this chapter is published in uh, MCV Workshop at Mikai 2016. So the task would be given an ROI, how do we uh, uh, convert it to a segmentation of the local image? Seed-based segmentation is one of the approaches that can easily be taken uh, care of in this, uh, for this application. For that, however, we need to carefully choose the foreground seeds and the background seeds. So we propose after extraction of the ROIs, use image saliency to refine and find the seed maps and then use the legion segmentation based on a seed-based approach. For the seed-based approach, we uh, use random box segmentation, which is an interactive seed-based segmentation, assigning a probability to each node of uh, the graph or basically each pixel in the image uh, based on the predefined labels and the probability of each pixel being dependent to each of those labels. So how do we define uh, the foreground and background seeds, which is the most uh, important step in this process? So we know that we have extracted the radiologist uh, ROIs based on the gaze data. Given that point, that point might not exactly land on a specific organ or a specific tissue in the region. So we define and uh, we use image saliency maps to find the most salient object in a region, and we put the foreground seed on that region. And then we use image gradient to find the object vicinity and put background seeds randomly outside that object, and then perform the segmentation. These are the results, again, with the same three radiologists that we did the experiments with. Uh, they uh, studied four uh, CT scans for us, and we basically uh, segmented the abnormalities in the regions of uh, their interest. The absolute <coughs> house uh, dwarf distance was 1.45 millimeter and die similarity 86. So now that we know that it is feasible to encounter uh, that uh, you know ROI extracted from the gaze into the image analysis, uh, we need to come up with a more general and better representation for, uh, method for uh, local image analysis because seed based methods are sensitive to location, to noise, and also fuzzy boundaries. With that, I move to the next uh, part of my presentation, uh, which is deep multitask learning for local image analysis. The content of this chapter is published in EMBC 2018 and, is, uh, and was selected as an oral presentation. So knowing that a more appropriate modeling of the local image analysis is needed, uh, and also we mentioned that segmentation as the size and shape measurement and also the classification of the tissues as detection of uh, normal, abnormal tissues could be very helpful for the local image analysis. We hypothesized that these two tasks share some underlying features, uh, namely size, shape, texture, and all that. With that, these two tasks can be modeled as auxiliary tasks uh, from a machine learning point of view and can be jointly learned for a better performance on both tasks. The challenge that we had on this particular problem is that we have very limited annotations for the segmentations. Uh, just as an overview of uh, the multitask learning, multitask learning is basically learns multiple tasks by optimizing multiple loss functions at the same time within one network, as opposed to uh, conventional methods which had separate networks for each of the tasks, uh, separate inputs, separate outputs, here we have all the inputs, and then some shared layers, some task-specific layers, and then trade the whole network jointly on all of the tasks. Multitask learning has a lot of benefits. Some of them specifically uh, we uh, used in this formulation, uh, which I'll go uh, over. The first one is the generalization ability, which is reduce the chance of overfitting, especially given that we have uh, very limited data for our segmentation by the inductive bias that it creates. Uh, and also, while, uh, while uh, multiple tasks are being trained simultaneously, uh, the, uh, the representation that is being learned in the network is a more general representation. 
It also highlights the underlying feature for noisy tasks with limited high dimensional uh, annotated data, which is most of the case in medical images, it's kind of hard to find uh, the discriminative and non-discriminative features. And by having the network trained on multiple tasks, we basically can focus the attention on more relevant features. <coughs> and also dealing with lack of data with the implicit data augmentation that it has because all of the tasks, all of the representation that is being learned now is benefiting from the data coming from all of the tasks. This is the overview of our deep multitask CNN. It's uh, a 3D convolutional neural network encoder decoder. Uh, the shared layers uh, are the gray ones uh, in the encoder and decoder. We have two a set of task specific layers. The input is a 3D volume of 40 by 40 by 6 around the region of interest extracted from the gaze pattern. The outputs for classification of the tissues, uh, which we had full supervision, meaning that for the data set that we use, we have all of the labels for this task and also the prediction uh, for segmentation, which we had semi-supervision because we didn't have labels for all the tasks, but all of the examples in our data set. So we propose to use a semi-supervised learning uh, because we don't have enough samples for the segmentation. However, since we have very limited segmentation data, if we just simply use semi-supervision, we basically end up having backpropagating the noise to the data, uh, to the network. That's why we are proposing to do that through a multitask network so that we basically benefit from the better and more generalized representation learning and have a more uh, stable uh, semi-supervised learning. So the algorithm for the semi-supervised learning, assuming that we have a set of labeled data, XL and YL, and a set of unlabeled data, XU, we first train the model <coughs> on the labeled data and then for each uh, unlabeled data, we basically use the network prediction to gradually uh, predict the labels for the unlabeled data and add them as a training data. And we do that step by step gradually till, till the point that the performance of the network on, uh, on scene validation set does not improve anymore. And that's our final model. Uh, for the evaluation, we use DICE similarity coefficient as the measure of uh, segmentation performance and precision and ROC curves for uh, the performance of classification. The experiments that we run is single task, which means that we train the network on only one of the tasks, multitask jointly training the network on both tasks, and also some supervised multitask, which I just proposed. The first column shows the method, the second column shows the performance on segmentation, and the last column is showing the performance on classification as sensitivity. As you can see, by just converting the model from single task to multitask without adding any, uh, any, any semi-supervision, just the manual labels that we had, we could get noticeable performance on both the tasks. And also, if we apply the semi-supervised approach that I just mentioned on the whole network, we can end up having uh, over 10% uh, improvement on both tasks over the baseline. These are some learning curves which are showing how the performance and the training is being uh, actually very better since the beginning. Uh, the blue curves are showing the proposed method, and the green and pink are the baselines. Uh, also, we propose to uh, uh, use uh, this ROC curve, the, this, this score, uh, which is the false positive scores can add eight different sensitivity levels uh, for a better understanding of how the network is performing for classification. And uh, we compare our results uh, to the state of the art at the time. And as you can see, we basically outperform the state of the art uh, with a very large margin. We're concluding the local image analysis. Now I want to move to the global image analysis modules. Um, the goal here is to handle the regions of uh, the cases which are basically outside the regions of interest of the radiologists, meaning that the cases that the radiologists are not taking a look at. I start this chapter by uh, talking about a detection, lung nodule detection framework, uh, which is handling the missing, missing abnormalities in the lungs, which can be because of uh, very uh, similar uh, texture to the neighboring tissues. As you can see, uh, the red circle is basically showing the abnormalities, which is pretty much very similar and easy to miss. And I also conclude this chapter by uh, talking about the pancreas segmentation framework, uh, which with the goal of guiding and limiting the search areas of the radiologist by segmentation of the complex organs. As you can see, the red boundary is showing the boundary of the pancreas in a CT scan, 
uh, it's very hard to distinguish that region, and the abnormalities normally happen in the edges of the pancreas. So having a good, robust segmentation can help the radiologists limit their search area and find the abnormalities much easier. The content of this chapter is published in Nikai 2018 and has been highlighted uh, as top 10 research findings in uh, UCF and also patent pending by UCF. So as for the motivation, I already mentioned that it's very important to capture the uh, long abnormalities in the very early stages. Uh, the uh, survival rate, as can be seen, can dramatically decrease if we miss the abnormalities in the earlier stages. However, the middle chart shows that only 26% of these abnormalities are being captured in the earlier stages. And that's not only because they're very tiny and similar to vessels in the lungs, and, that, and they, they're missed because of that. Here in this chapter, we propose a detection framework to capture those tiny abnormalities and target this issue. As you can see, the abnormalities are very easy to miss in the lung and very similar to uh, the normal tissues. The related work on uh, lung nodule detection uh, can be categorized into three main uh, topics. So first, multi-step frameworks, which are having a candidate detection and false positive detection, this happens because capturing tiny abnormalities is very difficult, so normally multiple networks are needed to make the decision uh, for the detection. We have non-optimal search strategies like uh, exhaustive search or using uh, you know, other types of uh, um, suboptimal sub search strategies. And also suboptimal uh, models in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, patch-based or 2D or 2.5D models not capturing the 3D context fully. So what we propose in our method is uh, to address this computational challenge is to have a single shot detector which uses a single feed forward pass of a single network for detection of these tiny objects uh, and in a single scale which eliminates the need for multi-scale frameworks, pyramids and all of that which introduce uh, you know, a little confusion for the network. And it's because uh, the design, the specific design of this architecture <coughs> allows all of the abnormalities that we're dealing with to fit into one single scale. Our method is based on 3D convolutional neural networks and is being trained end to end. Uh, because we're benefiting from 3D convolutional neural networks, our model is basically reasons globally and makes a decision for the detection uh, based on the whole contextual information. In the context of a tiny object detection, uh, the challenge is that the information is normally getting lost uh, throughout the network till we get to the end of the network. And that's why we might have so many false positives or we might miss so many detections and that's why we need another network to refine these detections. To tackle this problem, there are two uh, main uh, approaches that we need to take. The first one is to keep the information flow. For that, we propose to use the densely connected uh, convolution of blocks which basically pass the information uh, from the low-level information to all of the future steps, high-level information, and keeps this information flow. And the other one is information selection, which is pretty important of uh, what features we select at each part of the network and pass it to the rest of the network for further processing. And these can be handled with different types of information selection and poolings, which we did an extensive study in this work. This is the proposed architecture. The input to our network is a 3D volume of 512 by 512 by 8. We have a set of densely connected neural uh, convolutional neural network blocks. The growth rate is basically the number of uh, channels in each uh, convolution and the number of uh, convolutions uh, in each of uh, the blocks. The matrix for evaluation is uh, sensitivity, number of parameters, and a CMT score, which is proposed by the challenge website that we use the data set, is the average of sensitivity at seven different false positives per scan. So we start with the 2D uh, SSD. SSD was the uh, state-of-the-art uh, natural uh, object detector at the time. Uh, and it, as we can see, the CMT score for this, uh, this model is 64%. We propose to replace uh, the convolutions in SSD by dense convolutions and also study uh, the different uh, pooling strategies. 
as can the, as can be seen, uh, the max pooling outperforms all of the pooling uh, strategies, and also disconnected could bump the performance uh, by three four percent. Then we design our own. 3D neural network based on this connection, and we study the effect of increasing the growth rate, which is basically the number of channels in each convolutional block, towards the end of the network, having more uh, computational power on the high-level features, and also having deeper blocks passing the information for longer times uh, in our network. And finally, the proposed method, which is benefiting from both increasing growth rate and deeper blocks, which basically outperforms uh, the state-of-the-art uh, object detector at the time uh, by around 30%. These are some uh, uh, ROC curves for all of the methods. And as you can see, the proposed method is outperforming uh, all of the baselines. We also did a comparison of the proposed method uh, on a tenfold cross-validation with the uh, long nodule object detector, which was state-of-the-art at the time. It needs to be mentioned that that detector was not a single detector, a single shot detector. It was composed of multiple networks for candidate proposal and uh, false positive reduction. Uh, we could outperform the results by using uh, around a third of their parameters. And this is the ROC curves uh, corresponding to the comparison with the SA of the With that, I want to move to the last chapter of my talk, which is the segmentation of complex organs and structures. Uh, the content of this chapter has been recently accepted for publication in Mikai 2019. So the motivation here is that 3D object segmentation is pretty challenging because capturing the 3D semantics uh, can be very challenging due to the large size of the images that we're dealing with. It's impossible to have a whole 3D image built into the GPU even with the back size of one to capture the whole 3D semantics. Uh, and also the complex sh shape of the organs that we're dealing with, which makes the problem pretty much com computationally impossible. Deep learning is currently the state of the art for semantic segmentation, and uh, currently deep learning methods are suboptimal in terms of capturing this 3D semantics. Before moving into what we propose here, uh, I first want to talk a little bit about the formulation of uh, segmentation in deep learning. So segmentation can be modeled as a joint recognition and delineation of the object, which is basically capture, capturing the context and location of the information. <clears throat> the limitation is that in the uh, deep learning uh, formulation of uh, segmentation, segmentation is modeled as pixel level classification, which is pretty good for capturing that context, but is missing the location and relation between the pixels uh, in, the, in the formulation. The state of the art loss function is normally cross entropy, which is single level, uh, single is, is a pixel level loss function, not encountering for relation between the objects. So, in terms of 2D semantic segmentation, the way that the literature tried to cap to tackle this problem it can be normally categorized into two categories: multi-scale frameworks, which are basically addressing the context capturing at different scales or adversarial learning frameworks, which are trying to capture these long relations by proposing an adversarial learning. They have uh, a segmenter, which is doing some prediction, and then uh, another network, um, a discriminator network, is trying to decide whether this prediction is coming from the ground truth, or uh, the prediction, which is, when trained in an adversarial manner, tries to encourage the segmenter network to predict outputs which are, in an image level, more similar to the ground truth. That said, this problem is still an open problem in 3D object segmentation. The methods which are out there are normally categorized into three categories. 2D networks, which are modeling the segmentation as segmentation of different slides at a time, which is missing the relation between the semantics in the third dimension. 2.5D or multi-view networks, which are basically uh, looking at the object from different points of views and then trying to train different networks to use the results towards the end computationally very expensive and normally having three networks at the test time. And partially 3D networks, which are impossible to capture the whole 3D semantics, but partially capturing them, which is, again, suboptimal. What we propose here is to capture these 3D semantics, shape, and long-range information in a computationally efficient way uh, through a 2D network using 2D projections. And we try to do that by using these 2D projections and an adversarial learning to encode these 3D semantics into a 2D segmentation. 
So 3D object can be projected on different 2D planes from different point of views. Based on the projection function that we define, uh, these projections can include uh, some information about the object shape, the object semantics, and the long range relationships in the 3D. And this information can be retrieved for segmentation. The framework that we propose is composed of three networks, the segmenter and two auxiliary networks. The two auxiliary networks are, not, are only used during the training, and at the test time, we only have one single 2D network. Starting with the segmenter, our segmenter is a simple encoder-decoder architecture. We, on purpose, use a very si a simple network, and we didn't use UNET or Tiramiso, any kind of uh, complex networks, because we wanted to show that with the correct form of supervision, uh, even a simple network has enough parameters to capture uh, the 3D and 2D and complexity of the task that we're trying to work on. So the network is being trained with a hybrid loss, uh, one coming from the ground tooth binary cross entropy and two coming from the two auxiliary networks which I go into the detail. The next component is the projective adversarial network uh, that we proposed for the first time in the literature. The inputs are the, 2D aggreg uh, the aggregation of 2D predictions coming from the segmenter and also the aggregation of 2D ground truth. Uh, we use a projection function uh, that we define, uh, which is differentiable for the sake of end-to-end -end training, to project these two uh, aggregations into one single image. Uh, the projection formulation is assigning a value to each pixel in the projection based on the number of occupancies in the 3D volume given uh, a viewpoint. So the goal of this network trained in a binary classification of making the decision whether the aggregations and projections coming from the ground truth or from the prediction is to capture 3D semantics and encourage the segmenter network to produce results which are in 3D semantics after projection similar to the ground truth. So we basically can model this 3D semantics in an efficient way. That network is being trained with the binary cross entropy loss for binary classification. The next module is the semantic, special semantics network. It has two branches. One branch is getting the segmenter's prediction and the ground truth multiplied by the object uh, fitted to the top uh, processing units. And then some features coming from the bottleneck of uh, our segmenter network for better and more smooth uh, training. However, we, we believe that all of the features from the bottleneck of that network cannot be useful for the auxiliary network and can hurt the performance. So we basically propose to do a selection of that features by some attention so that the network learns spatiotemporally where to pick the features and what to pick uh, and pass it to the auxiliary network. This is uh, the attention module that we use, which is composed of one by one convolution followed by softmax, assigning a weight or a confidence value to each of the features that is being multiplied to. So the goal of this network is to capture 2D semantics inside the planes and uh, when trained with a binary cross entropy loss, deciding whether the input comes from the prediction or ground truth, it encourages the network to predict uh, outputs which are specially similar uh, to, uh, to the ground truth. And it's needed because if we only use the projection module, we might in increase the chance of having false positives. The whole network is being trained end-to-end, -end, all three networks. Uh, DP and DS are auxiliary network and is being only used during the training and during the test time, we only have one single 2D network which is computationally pretty efficient. For the data set, we use the publicly available uh, TCIA data set from NIH. It contains 82 CT scans. The size of, size of the CT scans are 512 by 512, <coughs> ranging from 180 to uh, or somewhere around 500 slides which is kind of impossible to have uh, a 3D network capturing all of this information. That's why we propose to use this uh, projective framework. And the voxel spacings are ranging between 0.5 to 1. Dice similarity coefficient is being used as a measure of the performance of the network. These are some visualization of uh, the organ that we're trying to segment. As you can see, it's very hard to distinguish from uh, the uh, uh, neighboring tissues and it has a very complex 3D shape which is twisted throughout the body. 
For the ablation study, we start uh, doing the experiments by adding each of the components of our framework gradually and show their contribution. The encoder-decoder network only segmenter uh, is, of course, by itself cannot capture the performance. We also did an autres pyramid experiment to show that this problem cannot be um, handled by having multi-scale frameworks because of the complexity of the organ that we're trying to find. Uh, multi-scale might increase the chance of having false positives. Then we add the special uh, uh, semantic network, we add the attention module, and then finally the proposed method, which is basically outperforming the baseline by around 30%. We also do, did uh, a comparison with the state-of-the-art methods. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of points here. All of these state-of-the-art methods, which are proposed before our work here, are course to find iterative or multi-scale frameworks, uh, multi-step frameworks. Uh, our network is only one single network. Um, I want to highlight that our network is basically getting the lowest uh, uh, standard deviation, which is showing that it's pretty stable uh, when seeing different types of uh, noises or changes in the data. And also, the minimum dice, which is basically the worst case in the, uh, in the data set, is basically almost 20% uh, outperforming the state of the art which showing that our network is actually stable uh, in terms of you know, uh, variations in the data. So to conclude my talk, I first uh, started talking about uh, some gay sparsification and how can we use an eye tracking for a seamless integration of collaboration between the radiologists and computer vision modules. I moved uh, to the local image analysis, talked about a proof of concept and a more general framework uh, for the local image analysis, and then I talk about the global uh, modules for detection of the abnormalities for the regions that the radiologists are not looking at, and segmentation of the structures to help them focus their area of search. For the ones who are interested in uh, following this work, um, these are some future suggestions that, that I can make. Uh, for the collaborative framework, we use uh, a medical application. It's nice, uh, our, our framework is pretty generic, and it's nice to see its applications on uh, different types of uh, possible problems. It can be uh, various from uh, pilot training, AR, VR applications, autonomous driving, training purposes, and all that. Uh, given the luxury and the resources, it's nice to use uh, our framework to do a scan pass analysis on doing some behavioral patterns for the radiologist. Our work was the first one in the literature that proposed to use a, a, a graph analysis uh, for uh, quantitative measurements of gaze, and which makes this kind of analysis possible for comparison. Also, knowing uh, the different types of tasks that can be combined to include more clinical data into uh, our process for the multitask module can be a good direction to move. Uh, combining the diagnosis into the detection framework can even uh, make a more uh, general framework. And also for the last part, we, uh, at, the, at this point, we are basically choosing the viewpoints. It's nice to have a viewpoint uh, detection network integrated into our work so that based on each input, the viewpoint network predicts the best viewpoint for the projection so that it has the most information in the projection, projection and then include it uh, into the auxiliary network. During my time uh, in CRCB, I had the honor and chance to work on various different types of uh, projects, and these are the list of uh, my accepted papers uh, so far. <laughs>